So while people are still arriving, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the Every Learner Everywhere Expert Network powered by ISTE. Every Learner Everywhere recently launched the Expert Network to offer professional learning and coaching for higher education faculty and leaders to support their students and uh, through and beyond the COVID crisis, including the transition to digital learning. We encourage you to visit the Expert Network website. Uh, we are posting the link in the chat for you to go to to find out more information and to hopefully schedule a coaching session with one of our experts. Next slide, please. And so there's our experts. <laughs> Uh, so welcome to the Every Learner Everywhere Strategies for Success in Online Teaching and Learning. Next slide, please. Our interactive conference series, and it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. My name is Norma Hollebeck, and I'm the manager for network programs and services with Every Learner Everywhere. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take just a few minutes out to tell you about Every Learner Everywhere, the mission of our network. Um, Every Learner Everywhere is a collaborative uh, effort of 12 higher education organizations with expertise in evaluating, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of digital learning and the integration of digital learning into pedagogical practices. Every Learner Everywhere is one of three solution networks sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The other two networks focus on advising and developmental education. We work with colleges and universities to build capacity among faculty and instructional support staff to improve student outcomes with digital learning. Our mission is to help institutions use new technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of increasing student success, especially for first generation college students, poverty impacted students and students of color. A few quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's session uh, and we will share the link with you after the webinar. Throughout the presentation, we welcome your questions in the Q&A section. If participants raise their hand during the presentation, we will not be able to unmute you. However, we will be monitoring the Q&A as well as the chat. As a biology professor and in a former associate dean, I'm excited about today's discussion addressing DEI issues in STEM education. Our speaker today happens to be one of our professional coaches from the Every Learner Everywhere Expert Network, Dr. Elaine Villanova, Villanueva, sorry, <laughs> is a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at California State University, Long Beach. Dr. Bernal has been teaching chemistry at CSU Long Beach for 15 years and has uh, served as the coordinator for the College of Natural Sciences and Math, connecting students to industry, as well as working with faculty on curriculum. She is passionate about connecting chemistry to community and serves as an expert in engaging students in all backgrounds in STEM education, as well as serving on two NSF projects serving Latinx students. Dr. Bernal has extensive experience with K-12 student outreach, educational technology, and in the e-learning industry. Before entering higher education, she worked for the aerospace industry as a failure analyst. She earned a Master of Science in Material Science Engineering from UCLA. Dr. Bernal earned a Master of Arts in Educational Technology and Media, Media Leadership, uh, as well as her doctorate in Educational Leadership from CSU Long Beach. Dr. Bernal? Norma, thank you for that wonderful introduction and everybody, thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Elaine Villanueva Bernal um, and uh, uh, really happy to be here, spend time with folks and talk about how to connect climate justice and STEM education. Um, I think often what happens to, and what's inspired this um, talk is that a lot of STEM concepts tend to be um, talked or taught in isolation and not really connected to what's you know really happening out there, um, especially when it comes to climate justice and environmental justice. Uh, yeah, wait. Oh, okay. I'm like clicking, clicking. <laughs> okay, so just to you know, start off a conversation, um, I would like for folks to drop in the chat. Um, how familiar are you with environmental justice 
globally? How familiar are you with environmental injustice locally? So um, I, I've placed a few photos here just to kind of get folks thinking. Um, like for example, there's the Flint water plant, right? Um, so Flint, there was in Flint, there's, there was uh, in the water and then um, that's still an ongoing issue, unfortunately. Um, and there's actually a lot, a lot of legal action happening in that city um, as far as holding local, the local electeds at that time accountable for what happened or it was still happening. Um, the second photo is um, uh, from the Philippines. Um, this is after Typhoon Haiyan hit. Um, the Philippines actually experiences uh, about 20 typhoons every single year and those typhoons have gotten bigger and stronger. Um, and then finally, the third photo is um, one of the refineries in the Wilmington Crescent area where I grew up, not too far away from that. My parents still actually live like about five, 10 minutes from that. And let's see what's happening in the chat right now. So what are folks saying? Um, so yes, I see on the news um, things going on in the Indian lands with the oil pipeline. Okay, yes, yes that's still happening. Um, melting ice caps, of course. Um, yes, you've seen, that some folks have seen this on the news. Um, Yes, environmental justice is the most important learning outcome in all education at all levels and all, thank you. <laughs> yeah, certainly it's very, it's very comprehensive. Um, and then, yeah, it certainly, it depends on a lot of factors, um, you know, like how local it is, you know, if a lot of times we'll get, you know, what's, what's happening nationwide, right? Like for example, the pipe, the Keystone pipelines, um, yeah, so um, some familiar with both. Um, you do read about a lot about environmental justice. Okay, great. And then local super site, which impacts neighborhoods, um, issues as well as contaminated with, and many haven't gotten public water access in the Beaver Creek Dayton area. Okay. Yeah, I mean, often we do hear, we see a, a lot of things about this, but at the same time, it's like, how much do we really know? And then how can we, um, use those issues as a platform to connect with our students, especially when it comes to STEM, okay? Um, so if, um, folks, you can continue chiming in in the chat and then um, I will go on with the rest of my presentation. And then of course, as Norma had mentioned, um, you can drop any questions in the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions about um, any part of this presentation, I will have uh, time at the end to, you know, have a little bit more discussion about this. So a little bit about me and then you'll see um, some of the influence and like what informs how, why I teach how I teach. Like I'll be featuring a lot about what content I cover in my class. Not everything, unfortunately, but um, some, of the, some of the highlights that I do cover in my classes. So um, like Norma had said, I have been teaching chemistry at Cal State Long Beach for 15 years. More recently, in the last couple of semesters, I have also teach global climate change at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the California State University system, we are the largest state system in the nation. Um, and uh, there are, we, have, we do have 23 campuses, so we're very very um, large institution and then we um, have a lot of alumni that do go into um, professions like teaching and engineering so economically the system does contribute a lot um, and then so yeah I you know I'm a woman of color in STEM you know like like to promote um, more women going into STEM we are still very much underrepresented in the fields um, and then and this is my family. We are a multiracial family. Um, my husband and I both grew up in the area around Carson, Long Beach, if you're familiar with that area. Um, my husband is of African-American heritage. I'm Filipino and um, a little bit part Chinese. Our children are multiracial. So a lot of that certainly informs as far as like, why is it that I think about, um, especially science and environmental justice issues from a race and equity and you know um you know access issue right inclusive inclusivity issue because we certainly grew up in these neighborhoods where um a lot of the area was affected by you know by air pollution by water pollution right so we grew up with smog alerts you know as early as like third and fourth grade i still remember those um and then uh, i do a lot of um 
uh, well, pre-pandemic. <laughs> it's funny how you have to say pre-pandemic now. Um, so I do um, quite a bit of work with middle school and high school, um, some some level elementary school um, STEM outreach, especially um, with our um, Latino population, our Filipino population. So a lot of like historically underrepresented um, groups uh, here, especially here in Long Beach, Carson, um, Los Angeles area. So these are students from um, that were hosted by our college um, uh, access to, to for migrant students program. Okay, so our camp program, and you know we did some battery, uh, we built batteries, you know, <laughs> for for an afternoon. So that was really cool to do, and I love doing, I, I love working with students to um, do activities like this because the feedback that I've gotten, especially you know from, from my own students, um, you know, teaching at Cal State Long Beach and teaching at Dominguez Hills, I have a lot of students that grew up in the same community that I did. So it's really wonderful to connect with students at that level. Like, yeah, we grew up in the same area and I am here, you know, teaching in higher education now. Um, and uh, I'm pretty active with the community as far as um, advocacy and, and my activism. All right, so the first photo, um, no chemistry, no beer. <laughs> so that's, you know, it's kind of fun, but, but this is the March for Science in 2017. We had over a thousand people show up in, in just in Long Beach um, to March for Science and you know, create awareness, um, especially in the advent of the Trump administration at that time. And there was so much anti-science that was just really coming down the pipeline. Um, my, the other photo, um, that's me and um, several grassroots or, um, organizations in front of the Philippine consulate um, uh, advocating for human rights in the Philippines. Um, uh, this is this is certainly an. I think this this is actually can be like another seminar, but um, the U.S. Uh, but we have a lot of U.S. taxpayer money that does fund a lot of um, state and military violence uh, in the Philippines, unfortunately. Um, but I'm happy to answer more questions about that uh, maybe offline. So. Um, a little bit where I'm from. Uh, this is Cavite City, Philippines, and I am in that little tiny peninsula right there that's highlighted in like the red outline. Um, and the reason why and um, the, why I wanted to highlight this is that Manila Bay here um, is actually experiencing sea level rise four times faster than the rest of the world. So, you know, when I speak about climate change and, you know, climate justice, it certainly impacts me from a very, you know, on a very personal level. I mean, this is where I was born, you know, and then again, you know, like, and not just with where I'm from, but for a lot of folks in, you know, island nations and coastal communities, like there's a danger of like losing, you know, losing um, homes. Uh, and then just tying it back to Carson, California. So you saw this um, this photo earlier. This is one of our. This is, there's um, I think five, at least five major refineries that are in Carson, Wilmington area right now. Um, this is Marathon Oil, I believe. And actually, this uh, company had a couple explosions over the last um, last couple this last few years, actually. So um, wanted to highlight that as well. So again. Um, you know, a lot of why, of like, as far as what I'm going to show, it's really informed by my personal experiences, lived experiences in these communities. And again, just, be, you know, parallels, you know, being Filipino, um, having an African American husband, and, you know, my multiracial children, there are like, there are parallels between what's happening in the Philippines, what's happening with the Filipino community, what's happening with the Asian community, what's happening with the black community, right? As far as, you know, pollution and climate justice and environmental justice. So um, the photo on the left um, is uh, Reverend William Barber. And then the group that he's with is advocating for environmental justice in what's called Cancer Alley. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Um, but for now, just know that Cancer Alley is this 100, about 150 mile um, stretch of um, petroleum companies. So plastics, um, chemical companies, right, that are um, that run along the Mississippi River. And so many communities are being affected by the um, what's being produced in these manufacturing companies. And the photos on the right, um, those are from the Philippines again. Actually, the top one is from um, not too far away from where I was born, in Cavite. 
So there's a lot of plastic pollution and on top of that typhoons and also, um, you know, things that are related to climate change. And on top of that, we do have a lot of um, human rights advocates, uh, human yeah, rights advocates and um, lawyers that are being killed because um, of their work with environmental justice. So those are those photos. So again, um, uh, what's happening as far as what's happening in my native country and then here in the United States, there's so many parallels when it comes to um, Black Lives Matter as, and as, well, as well as you know, environmental justice. Okay, so um, stemming from climate justice, like how do we make those connections? How do we start to make those connections? So um, one of the things that, uh, actually I just cover this again <laughs> with my students. Um, so one of the things that we cover in my Chem 100 class, and just to give a bit of a background about what I teach, I teach chemistry for non-science majors. So I get everybody. And then, so I get the arts majors, I get the fashion majors, I get the business majors. So um, I've had to design my class where it's really accessible for everybody, where everybody can relate to this, no matter what background they're coming from. All right, so one of the activities that we do, and I think the, there should be a link on the chat at this time, is we talk about the state of the air, um, you know, in California, where they're from, and then students learn like, wow, there are a lot of what's called, these called red alert or orange days, right? Um, as far as, you know, uh, having high levels of ozone, high levels of other pollutants or particulate matter in the air. And then, so that kind of makes, um, students, uh, our learners think like, oh yeah, you know, chemistry isn't just looking at molecules and all these little particles. It's literally, you know, using this um, as a platform to look at the environment around this. So, um, and then, you know, we talk about smog, how that works, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, in chemistry, we're literally just counting all these particles. And then, so I try to make the connection with what this what it, like what this phenomenon is right like something that is happening in real life and then drilling down to see what the chemistry of it is um and we talk about of course you know like locally what's happening right um how uh, pollution affects these regions here um uh, one thing to highlight as well so los angeles long beach area we do have the high um the highest rates of ozone especially in the last few years even though we've made strides as far as um you know, like policies, you know, for better, you know, air quality, we still have, you know, problems like high ozone levels um, that are happening. Okay. Um, so molecules, right? I'm not sure if you expected to see molecules today, um, but one of the one of the threads that I also talk when it comes to climate change and global warming is um, so there's these uh, there's a concept called Lewis structures and also what's called um, and also with molecular shapes. So um, often these concepts get taught in isolation, like oh, draw this methane or water molecule, right? But um, what I try to, what I've, what I've communicated with my students, with my learners is that here's why learning how to draw these things is important. And it's important because when we know the structure and the shape of the molecule, we know how it can, um, we know how we can actually absorb IR. So I have methane here, I have CO2 and H2O, long story short. Um, there's a connection between, oh, you know, if it's shaped this way, if it has this many bonds, it can vibrate like this and bend and, you know, stretch all these kind of ways. And those, um, the way these molecules are shaped and um, how they move allows for the absorption of what's called infrared radiation or basically heat. So this is why, you know, things like CO2 get a lot of attention in the news because, it absorbs a lot of heat and which ultimately leading to, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming and also climate change. So really making that thread clear, like we're not just looking at these molecules because I mean, they, look, they do look cool, you know, they can kind of wiggle and, you know, bend in it and everything. But there is actually a reason why it's important to know you know, why these, you know, like why it's important to study, you know, how these molecules are absorbing, you know, things like infrared radiation and heat. 
Okay. Um, and, and finally, you know, we do make the tie um, from, you know, the, these greenhouse gases to actually what's called HFCs, right? So if you're not familiar with HFCs, so HFCs are commonly used in, in, in air conditioning. So it's, you know, we're using it right now, air conditioning, um, heating, vacuum systems, right? It's a pretty common gas. But what's happening with that is, um, is that this is, these are really also strong greenhouse gases. Again, we're not just looking at these, you know, cool structures of molecules, right? And trying to memorize them. Um, there is an impact of, you know, these molecules. So for example, HFCs are typically used again in supermarkets and then it can release so much H HFCs, which is like the equivalent of like 300 cars. So, um, so again, really making that arc you know, and tying, you know, what's happening at the molecular level and then what's happening at this more macro, like environmental level, all right? Um, and it certainly, oh yeah, one more thing, it certainly adds up as you can see, okay? And then, um, and then from that, you know, I, I introduce students to, well, okay, like why should they be concerned about climate change and global warming, right? Because it's not just about the, I mean, I, I may be preaching to the choir a little bit, but it's not just about, oh, the ice caps melting and things like this, you know, but there are literally local issues that are happening when it comes to climate change. So air pollution, air pollution is very regional. It's actually, you know, you can get neighborhood level data, right? Of what's happening, air pollution. And some, you know, communities are more impacted than others. Um, and then what are some solutions that can we come up with, you know, based on, um, you know, like having more green spaces, having more sustainable diets. So trying to, again, go from a, you know, molecular level, right? Like looking at little atoms and little molecules and really what is the, the what is the impact, you know, overall, right? Um, and then just go through these slides. So, you know, just trying to get students to think about what are these bigger level changes of climate change um, just because of like, you know, how these molecules are produced, right? And how these molecules um, can, um, again, like how they behave, right? So, uh, so I talked about sea level rise already. So again, um, you know, really making those connections between what's happening chemically and what's happening um, ultimately globally, right? And, um, I guess so some examples here. So uh, I mean, climate migration, right? Um, this is something certainly that we don't talk a lot about, um, especially here in the United States. We do have um, climate refugees, especially, you know, because of wildfires here in California, um, you know, sea level rise in coastal communities, especially like in states like Louisiana, right? Where a lot of people are losing their homes. So people have to move because of the impacts of climate change. Um, some examples, uh, like with you know, I mentioned Detroit earlier with Flint, um, so that's a water quality issue, and we do take a look at water and how certain ions are more um, easily dissolved in water, like heavy metals can be easily dissolved in water, like things like chromium and lead, and okay, well, yeah, like it's important to study these reactions and these phenomena because look how it shows up in the real world. Okay. And I think, um, and often I do get students that are like, well, I'm not really a science person. I'm not really a math person, but you can certainly use chemistry to look at the world and try to advocate for your community because yeah, I have like, Hey, this is information and I, and that you can use it to advocate for, you know, safer and healthier um, environments. Again, some examples of, you know, sea level rise and, you know, land loss, um, uh, and then here's another example of what we do in class. So this is um, Cal and virus screen. So Cal and virus screen is actually um, kind of a more like um, granular um, look at what's happening as far as environmental pollutants. So this doesn't just include ozone and particulate matter. This also includes things like benzene and then um, a lot of other chemicals that are used in manufacturing processes and transportation. And as you, and then what I like to you know. My students, what my students and I discuss is like, hey, look, just check out, you know, um, the like where the red, where the red parts are, right? What communities are being impacted? Um, so again, like using um, data that's actually public, right? And then helping students through a chemical framework um, try to navigate these uh, resources. 
Um, and then ultimately, you know, just taking a look at, um, you know, chemical phenomena like, like ocean acidification. Okay, so then, you know, the more CO2 we have in the air, these greenhouse gases, these CO2 um, get absorbed in the ocean, and then um, ultimately the CO2 will react with the water to create um, what's called carbonic acid and then leads into ocean acidification. But in any case, um, and I know this looks like a very complicated you know, <laughs> flow chart, but but the point is to um, to to make the connections between what are these chemical phenomena that is happening, and ultimately how does that result in people embodying certain, you know, like um, uh, health issues like impact on mental health, cardiovascular disease, right, from air respiratory disease. Um, there's a there's a there's a connection between, um, you know. Uh, what's happening in the environment, right? Air pollution, water pollution, and then COVID, okay? Like as far as um, the, qu the quality of the environment that people are living in. Um, and then, so this leads us to, okay, like if, if chemically, like these are the things that are affecting climate change, right? These are the sources of, you know, global warming and ultimately climate change. We can start to take a look at, well, who's being really impacted, right? And then we can start having that conversation about, you know, addressing diversity and equity issues within STEM because you've made that, you've given them the foundation of like, hey, this is what's happening, right? And let's, and how are people being affected? So then we start talking about, okay, like, you know, what are the places that are being affected? Um, and then who is being affected? Like women and children and older people, right? Communities of color are typically hit, you know, first and worst when it comes to environmental um, uh, issues. And then of course, how to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so really, like how to really spell it out, right? Because you make the connections, but uh, you know, how do you really get involved in that um, conversation? So now um, we can talk about things like environmental racism. So um, just some numbers here. This is, um, uh, you know, based on, um, so, yeah. So this is, I t talks about toxic waste, right? Um, just, you know, just to, you know, speak about where I am from, um, we do have a lot of, um, we do have facilities where, you know, trash is burned and we also have um, uh, more, we have certain communities that are exposed more to say um, battery manufacturing or battery recycling facilities um, that are closer to refineries, like, you know, like when I talked about where I was from, right? So again, um, a lot of uh, communities of color populations um, are exposed to toxic waste sites, you know, have higher exposure when it comes to pollutants. And then, so um, we can certainly start, you know, making that thread. And, and I think this is important because, it, again, with the students that I work with, I mean, again, you know, with, given how I grew up, it's important to have these conversations because we do, you know, ultimately we want a healthy environment for, you know, for everybody, right? We want a healthy environment to raise our children, you know, but we only know what we, you know, what we, what we know, right? And we don't know what we don't know. And I think what happens too is that when it comes to environmental justice, like, you know, what some folks said earlier, like, yeah, you kind of hear about it, but you don't know too much about it. And, um, and it's really important because of this. So what happens is, is that social economically disadvantaged groups, um, so, not they're not only more vulnerable to the effects of climate change again you know being hit first and worst but as far as having a say you know as far as like wait how can we make our you know community healthier and better right um you know there's less access for um, folks of color to green jobs to you know having clean energy right um so it's so again it's it's that's where the importance of like having that stem foundation right and then tying it to you know environmental justice advocacy that's where that really comes in okay because again it's about access of information um and then uh let's take a look at how many minorities are in stem so um you know again you know we do have while we do have a lot of um, initiatives, especially in higher education, right, so that students have access to, you know, being STEM major, you know, and having STEM careers. Um, uh, people like Black, Indigenous, people of color are still pretty much underrepresented in STEM. So that's another issue when it comes to addressing, you know, 
um, DEI um, issues in, in STEM as well. So representation, um, how people are affected, right, and environmentally. And then also there needs to be a shift in conversation as far as, um, you know, when it comes to environmental concerns of minority and low, in, you know, low income Americans. Um, so there is another link um, that should be on the chat now as far as um, what is the public perception um, of people of color um, when it comes to environmental risk. So there's this perception and, and based on you know research, there's this perception that people of color are like, oh, like that there isn't an understanding when it comes to environmental risk. But apparently, but actually that's the opposite of that. People of color have the highest sensitivity to knowing, hey, there is an environmental risk in my community and I need to do something about it. Um, and then also, yeah, so according to environmental deprivation theory, so exposure to environmental hazards and harm leads to greater concern about the environment and increased support for protective behaviors. So, you know, just to connect with what I've, um, you know, introduced in the beginning is that, yeah, you know, growing up in places where there is a refinery and then there's manufacturing areas and then there's pollution, it certainly increases that sensitivity as far as like, hey, I need to learn more about this and I need to teach others to do the same. Um, and then interestingly, um, there is a strong negative predictor of supporting voluntary actions to uh, slow global warming. So, um, so interestingly, um, folks that are um, with higher income or more affluent, there's a less likeliness to actually do something about climate change. So that, I thought that was very interesting um, in, in the study that, again, the link should be on the chat. And then ultimately we do want to message to develop messaging that accurately re reflects and portrays diversity in income and education levels. So, um, and then in the study too, what you'll see is that often um, there's an association between, oh, you know, the people who are, you know, advocating for environmental issues, especially DEI issues, you know, is, um, you know, mostly white or educated, but we really need to shift the conversation that um, it's everybody that really, you know, that we need, we, we need to have diverse um, uh, opportunities in this conversation, that it's not just limited to so many people. And again, it, it just, it connects back to what I mentioned with my students before, as far as like, oh, I'm not a science person, oh, I'm not a math person. But the thing is, if you're looking at environmental issues in your community, that is science that is happening right there. Okay. What I tell my students often is that science or chemistry is doesn't just happen in the test tube. It's everywhere. All right. And then so in being more connected to those concepts, I think it empowers students as far as like, oh yeah, I can talk about this because it relates to my community. And speaking of which, can connect us to the community. So um, uh, I do talk, and then so um, thanks to, um, I think if there was a few folks that mentioned the um, Native American um, uh, lands and the, and the pipeline issues. So um, the next thing is to, you know, try to, you know, um, educate students around like, hey, you know, there are organizations that also actually may be local to you that are, you know, um, trying to resolve, you know, these issues of environmental and climate justice. So this is water protectors. Um, that's just an example. Um, and this is People's Campaign. So um, I had mentioned the um, cancer alley before. Um, so this is the chemical corridor here uh, along the Mississippi River. So you have, you know, corporations like Dow Chemical and um, BASF, the Shell, right? So um, they have a lot of these emissions and, you know, chemicals that are going into the water, into the soil. So then um, you have folks like Poor People's Campaign that are advocating for companies to, um, you know, stop what they're doing. I think one of those, their most recent um, victories is uh, there's a plastics company called Formosa. Um, they were supposed to build a new facility or actually, yeah, or, up, or upgrade some huge nine million, you know, like million dollar facility. Uh, and then that would have, that would, would have, that would have resulted in more production of um, hazardous chemicals or cancerous, you know, chemicals. And then they were able to stop that production. Uh, one of the environmental justice groups that, that's near and dear to me, this is very local, this is East Yard Communities. So East Yard Communities works with um, primarily 
communities that are uh, nearby the 710 freeway. So, um, if, so if you're not familiar with the area, look up the 710 freeway and see where it is. Um, but along that freeway corridor, you have a lot of um, trucks that are going from the Port of Los Angeles and Port of Long Beach along those freeways. And then you have all these you know, diesel trucks that are um, you know, producing a lot of air pollution. Also, um, and then if you take a look at the photo to the right, there's a S-E-R-R-F, um, Covanta, you know, like looks like a tank there. So that's where they actually burn um, you know, waste over there. So, and a lot of these, you know, types of facilities are unfortunately concentrated along that 710 corridor. So East Art Communities does a lot of advocacy work to inform people in those communities as far as like, hey, this is what's happening in your community. Hey, this is these are the kinds of chemicals that are being produced by these companies, um, and then this is this is the impact on your health. And I think also too, um, uh, as much as we know about climate change, often we don't talk about how people are you know affected. Um, and then how, and then of course, uh, how to connect this to your classroom. So this is um, basically the last part of this presentation. So with that, um, I'll take any questions or if you have any feedback as far as like, hey, like this is how I see this connecting to my classroom or maybe I'm not really seeing it how to connect to my classroom. I am happy to take those questions now. So Elaine, we do have a question in the chat. Um, the question is, so from one factor, as politicians and policymakers achieve higher incomes from PACs and other sources, how do we sensitize them to the issue of climate justice and encourage our students to advocate as well? Um, so uh, what comes to mind immediately is, is connecting with politicians who are not necessarily associated with PACs. Um, so for example, so I actually have some news. So, um, so I'm not for sure if familiar, if people are familiar with this process. So there's, um, so I just uh, won a seat as a delegate for the California Democratic Party. And um, a lot, and several of us ran on progressive platforms or progressive seats. So one factor, I mean, one thing to do is to connect with um, political leaders or, or community leaders who um, are not necessarily connected with PACs because those are the folks that tend to, un that will understand like, hey, you know, like we need to get away from oil and gas right, or get away from oil and gas money. Um, and, you know, those are the folks that are sensitive to, you know, some of the issues that I talked about. Because often, yeah, it is hard to kind of get, you know, like, for, so people who are supported by PACs, um, it's hard to get their attention or like, or help them see the value of, hey, this is why we need to look at, you know, um, progressive platforms as far as, especially when it comes to alternative energy, right? I hope that answers that question. So we have another question for you. Um, when you're trying to connect this to your students, what kind of active learning do you engage them in to get them to really take in this subject? Um, when the, well, the state of error actually helps. Um, so having them look at data and then how, as it relates to um, just down to their zip code or their, you know, their region. So that's one way to get students um, involved. Um, I haven't done this since we went into safer at home orders, but we used to do, um, we used to do water testing for the drinking fountains on campus. And actually one year we, um, we had a positive hit for lead. For the water on campus, which led to, which led to, <laughs> um, uh, the the campus changing all like 130 drinking fountains into you know like filtered water, you know like um, the the fancy hydro stations, right? So we had that. So so those are the kinds of active learning um, strategies that I've done in the past. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Uh, do you get your students involved in service learning through your environmental and climate justice? 
Yes. Um, so again, unfortunately, this is like all like pre-pandemic. I mean, there's so many things I need to do, like to you know rethink. Like, oh, how can I do this um, as we continue virtual learning and safer at home orders? Um, but one thing I do want to introduce again is that I had my students look at. Um, actually, let me put this on the chat here. So it's called purpleair.com. I think that's the link. Um, if it doesn't work, let me know. But yeah, Google purpleair.com. Um, so they have real-time data for air pollution. And this is not just like air AQMD, um, this is, or, which is Air Quality Management District. This is also EPA data. This is also data from the Coalition for Clean Air data. So there's several sensors that are available through this um, platform. And then I had my students take a look like, okay, pick a, pick a community, right? And most students will pick like the community which they live in. Um, and they take a look at the air pollution, they take a look at what the possible sources are, and then they've, um, they've created proposals like, oh, here's how we can inform that community. Um, like, I had a student group, they, they did this wonderful proposal of like, hey, you know, let's go to the elementary schools or the schools in the area and talk to the parents about this is, you know, what's happening in your area. So I'd certainly, like, I'd I, def I definitely wanted to start doing that again because it was really rewarding to see my students, you know, do that. Since you've worked recently remotely, I guess that's going yeah. to the online version. Is yeah, the online version now. What are some of the tools and technologies that you use to help more actively engage your students? Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to... If I do this but there is a um let me see if i can get the chat but yeah I, was, I use um fet if folks are familiar with fet um i'll show you one thing that we did recently what was it fet. yeah um, yeah, we just had a we just had a um, class on molecular shapes, and again, which I mentioned, hey, it's important to know molecular shapes because you know because the greenhouse gases and climate change. Oh, sorry, it's um, P E P H E T. Sorry, here you go. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we One of my favorite website. <laughs> I love FET. I've been using FET for like, I don't know, like, I guess like since they, since they started and it was just like, you had to download, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the certain Adobe files and everything, but now it's all HTML. So it's really convenient to access, but yeah, I use FET a lot. Um, there's also an app I use called Chem 101. Um, let me see if I can get that here. So, um, I think yeah I met, I was talking to I was talking to Norma and Pam about this like I was that kid as an undergrad that was just like looking at all the YouTube videos or all <laughs> like all whatever whatever was available online right there you go. And then, so that's Chem 101. Um, it's a it's an app that students can use on their phone or their desktop. I like it because you can kind of it's it's handheld like this, and you can manipulate the controls like this. So that's why I like it, you know, because it inspires the video gamer in me. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the other tool that I use for my students. So I've heard a rumor, rumor. that you <laughs> like in terms of equity and access to digital technology that you prefer using more of the free or very low cost technology. Could you kind of go into a kind of an explanation of what drove you to that and, and how it works for you? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this, I mean, like I mentioned, a lot of this is, was just driven during my undergrad education, just trying to look for things that were free because often there were in the days of CDs, of <laughs> compact this, so things were really expensive. I mean, I mean, textbooks are expensive now, but things and, you know, resources were already expensive then. So that certainly motivated me to always look for resources that were free or low cost. And then, um, and then it's kind of come back full circle now because I was just appointed to be chemistry editor for Merlot. Um, so I'll type that down there too, as far as what Merlot is, but it's a repository for open educational resources and they have resources for pretty much every discipline you can imagine, I think. If there isn't one, let me know. We'll, we'll try to start one too. <laughs> 
So could you give a, some insight? I know that you've used Jamboard very successfully with your students. Could you oh, give yeah. some insight in terms of how you integrate that in to engage your students since y'all are working remotely? Oh yeah, so um, for Jamboard, it's a nice way to get feedback from students. Like even if I could like say how they're doing, right? Um, so Jamboard looks like this. I can actually, if you're not familiar with Jamboard, I can start one now. see editor okay all right so I'm going to drop a link okay so that's um, so that's Jamboard um, and then when you put your links in could you put it to panelists and attendees Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Silly Zoom. Okay. Oh, I can only do it for all for all the panels for some reason. I can't do it. Oh wait, hold on. Just kidding. There you go. Wow, drop down. Menu. Okay, so that's the Jamboard, and then you can kind of play around that if you like. Um, so the way it works is, if you do share screen, here's my Jamboard. Okay. Cool. Awesome. People join right away. Okay. Yeah. So then you can do, you can put like a little post-it here, right? Hello. And then um, you can, you can post a, you know, you can post a question to your students. Um, like for example, so the, the intro questions that I did, um, I, in the past, I've done this as a Jamboard, like, oh, like, what are some environmental, hello, <laughs> you know, what are some environmental issues that you know about locally and globally? And then it's nice to just kind of, you know, people put their post-its up there, right? It's a lot more visual and then people can see each other's. Um, oh yeah, awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, and then let me see what else. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you for dropping those links. Yeah, so um, I like Jamboard. It's a, there's also there's um, there's also some other apps like Miro or something similar where you can um, where you can make these really huge Jamboard like activities and have students um, give their feedback. Um, yeah, you can really you can really go you know go to town with this. So, and how do your students respond to using Jamboard? Do you get a lot of good feedback from them? And uh, thanks for paying attention to me. Or yeah, I do because the thing is, um, I think since it's to some extent like more kinesthetic, like you're actually like having to drag things or drag things around so that people can see each other's feedback. Um, I you know I do get good feedback from my students, as opposed to like you know the chat, right? So, so how do you when you do get those students that are, are like I'm not a science person um, and they just kind of become the wallflower and you really want to engage them. What do you find works best to get them from being intimidated by the science and from being that very passive, quiet learner? Um, what I do find is that, um, so I, I do use discussion boards um, in my class where um, it'll typically sum up maybe like four chapters that we covered so far. So we have, we currently have a discussion assignment that, that touches on the first four chapters we've covered in the semester. And then I'll usually ask them a question that is beyond the textbook, beyond what they learned in lecture. Um, so for example, um, you know, because we just talked about climate change, right? So I asked him about, you know, about a question on climate change, about um, what are some steps that we can take, right, based on the information that you learned in the last few chapters. So, um, so I like discussion boards because it gives folks that are typically quiet, right, the, for the opportunity to, you know, be able to say something. Do you have any inventive ways and innovative ways that you deal with discussion boards? Do you do post firsts? Do you do fish bowls? Do you do some of the other ways just to get them to not always just have to post once and 
forget about it? Oh yeah, I post, um, so I'll post, uh, yeah, I'll have the prompt and then students are, students need to do their original post. And then um, they also need to respond to someone and not just like agree with them, but like, hey, like, like I asked my students, like, how are you moving the conversation forward? So that's something that, you know, I encourage my students to do as part of their grade. Let's see, I was going to try to see if I can get our discussion prompt. And hopefully that answers that question. So we're still welcoming questions from the audience. Oh yeah, we have I've five been, minutes. I think I've hit most of the questions that I've received either on the side or through open chat. Um, I'm not seeing any others that I'm missing out on. So please, you're welcome to, while she's trying to find her discussion prompt, uh, we're still, there's still time for you to post a, a question or two. We've got about five more minutes. Oh yeah, I found my question prompt. There you go. So yeah, so this is my, um, this was their, this is their first discussion um, uh, assignment. So, because um, one of the things too that we initially talk about in this class is, it is looking at, um, or starting to think about chemistry through your portable device. I mean, what better way to talk about chemistry than your cell phone, right? And all the things that go into it and all the resources that go into it. So then, um, so I asked them like, well, now that you know how your portable device works and where it's made from, you know, think about the environmental impact of making just one phone or even just having a phone that lasts for about two to three years, right? So, um, and it touches on all the chapters that they've covered so far, including air pollution, including including, um, you know, carbon emissions and climate change. So it touches on that. So it gets them to think like, hey, I think it gets them to summarize what they've learned so far and think broadly about what the impact is of something like, say, a cell phone. And how do your, do you have a problem with the student? I mean, I have had this where students post the very bare minimum. How do you encourage them to be more active? Do you use a rubric or do you drive them in, in other ways to be more robust in their responses? Um, I ask, I, I typically just ask questions like, well, I, you know, I like that you said this, but have you thought about, you know, <laughs> it's always like, hey, have you thought about this? Oh, okay. Well, you know, what about this? Right. So I'm always like, what about, you know, get students chatting. <laughs> It's always fun to get them chatting. And then when you can't get them to stop because they're so excited, <laughs> that's the fun part. It's like, okay, we do need to go on to the next subject. <laughs> okay. Um, do you find by focusing on equity issues that more students of color attend your class? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, like I do, the thing is about Cal State Long Beach, I, it's, it, is pri it is a Hispanic serving institution. So, I, I mean, even... Yeah, I, I already do get a lot of um, diverse representation in my classes. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know what its current demographics is in my class. Um, but I have, you know, encouraged, I mean, I have at least gotten students to, at least from based on feedback so far, um, gotten students to think, oh, I can have, you know, like a, maybe a job in environmental justice or maybe like pursue, some, you know, career in environmental justice. I have gotten that feedback so far. Um, another question, um, I guess question, but it's affiliated more with the presentation and not on the focus of the webinar, such as being certain to focus on the pros of dams versus the cons of EVs, drilling of materials, and the cons of nuclear energy. Let's see. Oh, like, do I mean, is the question, I mean, are you asking if I cover that? Because I actually, I do, I do cover that in my class. The um, question's in the chat if you want to read it better than me. <laughs> okay, wait. Yeah, I, okay. So such as being starting to focus on the pros of dams. Yeah, um, I haven't talked about dams, um, but I do talk a little bit about drilling for materials in my class and then also like pros and cons of nuclear energy. Um, pros and cons actually of different types of energies. Um, uh, I do, I feel like I am a little, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pro solar <laughs> in my class. I'm pretty pro um, alternative energy. But yeah, we do talk about um, things like, you know, like nuclear energy and what are the pros and cons of that. 
Have you noticed a trend in students pursuing STEM because of environmental justice, DEI, et cetera? Or does this interest tend to come after they enter the classroom? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, to, anecdotally, it seems like more and more students are, you know, going into like, it going into STEM because of environmental issues, but it's not nearly as much as like, I wanna to go to med school. Like we have so many students that go to, wanna to go to med school. Um, well, I mean, at least in my class, cause my, my class is, a non, is for the non-science students, um, you know, I haven't really seen as far as like, well, I wanna use this major to, you know, maybe pursue environmental issues. Like I haven't seen a lot of that. I find it interesting, the question on the dams, you're coming from a chemistry background, so you tend to lean more on the environmental things towards the chemistry stuff. Well, yeah. I, teach, I teach environmental science. I tend, I go into the dams really a lot. I'm like, what's the pros of having a dam? What's the, you know, the reservoir? What does it do? Creating habitat, destroying habitat. So it's really funny to see it coming from an environmental, a chemist versus a biologist, how you approach the the whole concept and everything. So I find that interesting. Um, another question, do you think regardless of the course subject material, professors should do a better job of highlighting equity issues? I think so. Um, I think pretty much in any subject, you can start to highlight equity issues, whether it's in the liberal arts. Um, I mean, easily you can think about like, well, what is their representation of, um, I mean, what is, you know, what is the representation, say, of Black, Indigenous folks of color, right, in within this discipline? Um, higher education, you know, uh, being from the get-go, it tends to be very male and very white and also very old, um, especially in STEM. But you can certainly address those issues, um, you know, across any discipline. Um, and I think, you know, like for me personally, I think it, it certainly makes teaching a little bit more rewarding because, you know, these are issues that I care very deeply about and then that I can connect it to my discipline, you know, and connect it to chemistry. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, it actually like highlighting that in pretty much any discipline you can, you know, you know, think of, like that would be, that would be really beneficial. So I'm not seeing any more other questions. So I would like to uh, thank Dr. Bernal for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do ask that you take a few minutes to complete our survey for today's presentation using the link that we're putting in the chat. If you've got something else going on right after, don't worry, we'll send the link to the survey when we send you the recording and the slide deck links on, you'll be getting those on Tuesday. Um, just as a quick reminder, we do encourage you to visit the Every Learner Everywhere website, our resources page, and the Expert Network page. You can always sign up for a session, a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with, with Elaine or any of our other six um, experts. Um, it is a no-cost service, so we do encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, but I would like to thank Dr. Brown one more time for her time and her efforts. I would like to thank our participants for attending today's webinar. Uh, I would like to thank my backstage production folks for helping keep everything running smoothly. We look forward to seeing you all um, next week for our live Q&A expert panel um, on inclusive teaching. And the panelists will also be from our expert network. So we're encouraging you to participate next Friday as well. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.